ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते Vasudevaya I bow to the Lord I bow to him in all of you In my yesterday's program I was reminded afterwards that I didn't finish that story I hope you were listening last yesterday because in that story I told about the time when this deva came down to a saint and offered to take him to the astral world in a chariot and he said what you've offered me is such a colossal uh mistake such a colossal colossal um result of living in the astral world that eventually you have to come down to this world and do it all over again he said thank you i would rather remain here in this world and continue then he said isn't there any alternative and the deva said well yes there is um for those who are much more advanced spiritually because the great disadvantage to living in the astral world was that you can enjoy but you cannot advance spiritually and that's you're already very highly advanced so he said the uh disadvantages are so colossal that i uh i would like to know what alternative there is is there anything more that one can achieve he said yes for those who who meditate very deeply but they have for that you have to stay in this world you go beyond that world to a lightless light and a darkless dark but that world we cannot from our stage our plane of existence really explain well the saint said in that case i would much rather live in a physical body and remain here until i achieve that final state now to achieve that state as i said yesterday you must be completely free from the ego and to free yourself from ego consciousness is always to feel that god is doing everything now because of that i have met many saints in india who were all together withdrawn from everything one thing that i noticed with my great guru was that he was already so free he could um enjoy the world because there was nothing of him in it i remember one great master in fact my guru told me he was already a paramukta he had achieved moksha full liberation and uh he was a disciple of ramana maharshi his name was sri rama yogi and i had the opportunity to spend uh four days in his company in his in his presence it was uh, in a little village outside nelore a village called buchira di palayam and uh, he was very serious very uh, he was full of joy but he didn't laugh he was sort of on his way out and having to be sure that nothing attached to him here there are many different attitudes and you will see many uh, sannyasis and spiritual people acting I would say excessively stern. I remember somebody telling me about one swami who was being very sort of like this and as, as if it is fine and uh, he was saying goodbye to people from the car and as soon as he had left he could he saw him slump at the back of the car and open up a newspaper. Well, for God's sake why can't you be natural? I remember a monastery I went to a convent for women in the west and the woman who was talking to me welcoming me she said and there we have our chapel and all this breathless kind of awe and reverence and just then the priest confessor came up the steps and he was carrying a big box of chocolate i never heard a more girlish giggle i would say be natural don't put on a phony air and in that light there is this little story that my guru told which i've always found fun The master's reactions were 
as I said, appropriate, never motivated by personal feeling. Once, when he was still relatively young, he was late for a lecture and set off at a run to keep his appointment. Someone urged him, now, don't be nervous. One can run nervously, the master said, or one can run calmly. But not to run when one has to is to be lazy. Too much of the spiritual path is not calmness and dispassion. As Vivekananda said, so many peasants are not manifesting sattvic qualities, they're manifesting tamasic qualities. To be lazy is not to be spiritual. You have to be full of energy and... Uh, this attitude you need to have in your work, in your office. This spiritual path is not for people who have finally left their work, retired from work, gone to a cave, gone to a cave and perhaps absolutely exhausted can hardly raise a finger and so they look dispassionate. You've got to be dispassionate from the beginning. You've got to enjoy what you have to do. My Guruji told me a story of... Uh, a very advanced disciple of his, Durga Mata, he called her. Um, she, she and several of the young monks were painting Mount Washington, which is a huge building. And the monks were painting it in a spiritual way. And Durga was... <coughs> and he said, that's the spirit you need to find God. Don't think that God will be pleased if you're sort of languid through everything. And lifting your food to your well, no, that's the one thing that I've seen sannyasis don't do. They eat avidly, often. <laughs> but don't think that you can be languid. That's not the way of God. Remember that God had to have tremendous energy to bring this universe into manifestation. We've got to come up to that kind of level of energy if we want to find God. And that's why when you meet real sannyasis and real sadhus and real saints, you see men and women of great energy. Ananda Mohima, who was always very dispassionate, yet she had a lot of energy. What, if you watched her walk, I, was, I often visited her, and she, she would walk like a general, a little short body, but very determined. This is what you need in your work. Be determined, be full of energy. But remember, God does it through you. Don't don't be nervous when you act. Don't, don't think that you are doing it. That's what makes you nervous. But if inwardly you feel he is the doer. You know, my guru told us something quite astonishing to me, that he was once William the Conqueror. Now, I had grown up under the English system, and I'd always thought of William the Conqueror as one of the great villains of history. And here I found he was my own guru. But I asked him... Um, in all your lives, do you always, because he's been an avatar for a long time, he's been a liberated soul, I said, do you always, are you always conscious of samadhi? And he said, no. You're always conscious of being inwardly free. That's the big thing. Be inwardly free. When samadhi comes, it will come. But certainly, he could not have been Arjuna, who he was. He could not have been William the Conqueror, who he was. He could have not have done those outward roles had he been always lost in samadhi. So we have to have that sense of inner freedom, not the feeling that we've um, got to be always withdrawn from everything and looking at everything as if from a high mountain peak. I know my Guruji told me, I had two desires when I came to him. One was to be a hermit and just seek God. But the other one was that I thought this, after reading autobiography of a yogi, I thought, this is so wonderful. I've just... I've just got to do what I can to let other people know about this message. And so I had that desire, but having met him, I wanted to be a hermit. Uh, he didn't answer that desire. He told me I had to work. He made me teach. And I said, sir, I don't want to be a teacher. He said, you'd better learn to like it because that's what you're going to have to do. He told me my life was one of intense activity. But what I've seen in that activity is that there's been more and more freedom in my heart. That's where you need to seek, really. It says in the Bhagavad Gita that uh, Raja Janak and many others achieved God through Karma Yoga. The, uh, the, the whole secret is how you act. 
If there's the thought, this is mine, all mine, you're nowhere near. If you say this is his, all his, that's the attitude of the true devotee. Now, when you act, therefore, don't act lazily, but feel as if God were working through your hands. Feel, you know, our Guru taught us a system of energization exercises. If you can come to any of our classes, because these are things difficult to teach through lessons. We try to. But you know, when I was in SRF, I, I was the head of the center department. That meant I had to go all over the world teaching. I didn't find one person who had learned the energization exercises from the lesson or was practicing them. It was only when I could show them that they began to understand. So please learn them in person if you possibly can. The thing is that these exercises are absolutely wonderful for filling your body with energy. I remember many years ago when I was building the first dome at Ananda Village, where that was 36 years ago. Was it? 67 it was even. That was 37 years ago. And uh, there was a, a staple gun. I have small hands. And uh, I had to reach hard to get around this staple gun, and it took a lot of strength to make it go even once. There was a woman in the group that was working with us, and she couldn't even use two hands and squeeze it. She couldn't squeeze it at all. And uh, I did about 500 staples, and at that point, suddenly my, my hand just wouldn't work anymore. And then I said, well, but I've got to finish this job before the winter winds come and the snow of storms and snow which would have ruined everything. And uh, so I just put all my energy into my hand, remembering this principle which I had learned through um, energization exercises. I sent energy to my hand and uh, once did it, and then twice. By the 10th time, suddenly it became easy. And I was able to go another 500 times. Now that's what they call second wind for athletes. Many athletes have reached that point where they run as far as they think they possibly can and then give it that little extra push and suddenly they get what they call a second wind. And in fact, air, prana, the breath you take and the energy of the body, these are a little mixed up in the yoga teachings. But uh, the real meaning of them originally is energy, not breath. Breath is tied to the energy and that's why the words are used together. Uh, jeta. Jete Pran Chai Ma, that Bengali song, uh, I'll sing it to you someday, it's a beautiful one. Amar Shadana Mithilo, Ashana Purilo, Shokkoli Furae Jai Ma. And it goes on and it says, Jeseta Jete Pran Chai Ma. My breath is no more than my breath. My whole energy longs to go to that place. Um, uh, it says, of where there is love, jeta jete pran ma, to go into that love. We have to have a lot of energy for that. And what the yoga teachings teach when they speak of prana is not just the breath. It's the whole energy of your being. Well, athletes find it in their way, but the principles are the same. Well, mind you, this is one of the wonderful things about teaching yoga, that you discover that the principles of yoga are based on what we all know but aren't conscious of. It isn't conscious dynamic to our awareness. That's all it is. But when they say, for example, to concentrate here at the point between the eyebrows, that is because... The energy and concentration gathers here. I remember a dog was one time when I was with my guru and we were having lunch and the dog next door came over and had its brow wrinkled, straining up toward the food. My guru said, look, he's so concentrated on the food, his mind is here at the point between the eyebrows. You know, when you concentrate deeply, you, you tend to knit your eyebrows. It's just a human fact. When you feel inspired, you look up. There was a, a photograph or a painting or something I saw in a, a chemist's shop, a, femi, a pharmacist's shop, where a young, they were trying to encourage young men to become pharmacists. 
And uh, he was looking. Now, how could you imagine them painting that painting? Looking up into this beautiful future of being a pharmacist. Okay, it, everybody's got to have a job and it's honorable. But why was he looking up? It would have been ridiculous to show him, wouldn't it? When you're inspired, when you look forward to something, when you really want something, you look upward. Why? Because superconscious is centered here. It's not centered in your knees. When they speak of a young swain whose heart has been broken in disappointed love, it's the heart that feels it, not the knees again. You say your heart is broken, you don't say my knee is broken. There are certain truths, and I could go into many of them, but this is not the day for a yoga lesson. What I'm trying to bring out, though, is that what uh, we know is what yoga teachings take and extend it. Of, of our present day knowledge, we can go here, we can go here, we can go a hundred different directions. But yogis can say, this is the right one. People don't know that, that's why they need yoga. But yoga doesn't take you way out on a limb from what you really are. Yoga takes you back to what you really are, and it shows you those aspects of what you've experienced in life which really um, help you to fulfill yourself. For example, somebody sees an ice cream cone. <laughs> well, that's not going to take you toward happiness, and in fact, an ice cream cone won't make you happy. It will give you pleasure for a time, but then maybe becomes the stomachache. There's always an opposite to every pleasure, an opposite displeasure, an opposite pain. This is the law of duality, and you can't escape it. Be calm in yourself and be detached in yourself. Remember that in your true self, nothing can touch you. If you want to be a devotee, a sadhak, remember, you don't have to go to the Himalayas. You don't have to give up your family. What you need to do is learn in yourself to practice that deep inner detachment so that you see that wherever you are, as this song which I'm about to sing to you, where e'er he dwells, cool gales shall fan the glade. The, the reality is that when you live in God, God lives in you, joy to you. Streams bound through summer meadows, fragrance blows on every Where he dwells, the earth in glass. 